Hi, uh, Matt Sinclair. Today I wanted to compare and contrast two regulations. First, the EU Digital Markets Act, the DMA, uh, and second, the UK Digital Markets Competition and Consumers Bill. These are major new laws intended to reshape digital markets with huge implications for the digital platforms that are going to be regulated and for all of their many commercial stakeholders, from media companies to consumer brands, all kinds of tech startups. And it will absolutely change the kind of digital services uh, that you and I use as well. So if you work at almost any sizable business and you don't think this matters for you, you're probably wrong. Uh, this is, I think these regulations are worth knowing about and I think they're worth considering together. So both of these bills have been in the works in one form or another for quite a while. Uh, the UK bill though is still subject to parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, so it might change uh, and it's likely to kind of really bite in 2025 if it goes ahead kind of neatly from here. Uh, the DMA, there isn't probably the same scope for change, uh, but there is still obviously lots of work to be done figuring out the translation from a big picture law to practical implementation. And it's likely to be binding behavior in 2024. Uh, compliance is gonna be a massive process though. And you know, even you know, 2025 is gonna come around really fast. Uh, the digital platforms are gonna have to be ready for both really quickly. Um, particularly because both these laws have huge potential fines behind them. In both cases, the cap is set at up to 10% of global turnover. And if you think about the size of some of the businesses we're talking about here, that can get into some very big numbers. Now, that doesn't mean that's going to happen day one if there's any kind of breach, but it does mean there's a lot of risk uh, if platforms aren't able to respond to some of the quite ambitious demands in these regulations. I think it's worth looking at them together, which I haven't seen done elsewhere uh, in, in a lot of detail yet, because most people who really have to think about the EU DMA will also need to think about the UK uh, DMCC. And so that means that you know, if you haven't looked into DMA already, um, you might as well use that as a starting point and get your head around both. Um, if you do already know the DMA, I think thinking about the, the DMCC as, as a version of that that's approaching the problem in a slightly different way, it's the best way to get your head into the new UK bill. Now look, quick caveat before I get into this, these are large complex laws, properly understanding them, tracking their impacts through to specific businesses and planning a response is gonna require compliance professionals, a whole range of business stakeholders, lawyers and economists like me in the room. Um, this Treat this as a good a first hot take um, and we're, getting, we're all, it's, we're all going to have to get our heads into this, you know, over the months, months to come, bringing together probably a diverse range of skill sets to really respond effectively. So before I get stuck into what they do and how they vary from each other, I want to step through some interesting kind of higher level uh, um, uh, analysis. So first, there are a lot of similarities. These are fundamentally both ambitious regulations premised, rightly or wrongly, on analysis, there are serious structural problems with competition in digital markets that are not susceptible to regulation through the existing toolkit available to competition regulators. It's important to remember, the status quo ante is not no regulation, uh, at least particularly not in this area. The status quo ante is competition regulators with serious powers that they can and have been bringing to bear in digital markets. But the analysis is that those aren't good enough, uh, either because they aren't sufficient uh, to achieve what policymakers are looking to achieve, or because they'll achieve it too messily or too slowly or too unevenly. I think the latter in particular has sense that uh, getting there one decision at a time um, will be in some ways unfair and uneven and slow is certainly part of the rationale for the DMA that's been articulated by uh, the relevant commissioner. So having said there are some similarities, these are fundamentally sort of part of the same genre. There are also some big differences. Firstly, the EU law includes more specific obligations around data. This is just, I think, I think right back to, you know, back to GDPR and before, this has been an issue top of mind for, you know, for EU policymakers. They're seeking to prevent its being combined, including specific provisions around combining data for advertising. This is going to be, I think, operationally very challenging for a lot of organisations, and it fits with a general interest uh, among EU policymakers in the topic. But there are some versions of this that you will see in the UK and elsewhere. The UK law includes more consumer protection measures 
I think it's in large part reflected in the EU, those measures were done separately through a package of directives, which has been you know, called the New Deal for Consumers. Uh, but it doesn't mean that including them here, you know, it, it does matter that they're included here, because I, I believe what that means is that that same, those same massive fines are backing up you know, rules around things like reviews in online shops uh, or um, subscriptions, and, I, and, and you know, whether that's sort of subscription traps. And I think it's kind of an interesting question whether that is really proportionate, whether you know, some of these kind of consumer protection rules need to have quite the uh, massive weight of this big new competition law uh, behind them. But I think UK policy has always kind of treated these as two sides of the same coin. Hence, you know, the, the, the CMA does both. Uh, this is the UK Competition Markets Authority does both in its activities, and that's why they've been combined here. The big differences, though, are in the underlying approach so, and, and how much it's written into the rules. Uh, so the DMA includes very expansive powers for the Commission, don't get me wrong, but it is mostly written in terms of pretty specific obligations for a relatively tightly defined set of platforms. And to the extent those regulations and their impacts vary, it's based on the size of the platform and the kind of activity it's conducting. So you know, there are some regulations which are for search engines, for example, uh, or things that provide a search engine style function. The, D, the UK's DMCC, on the other hand, gives the CMA a lot more latitude to design measures of uh, re conduct requirements of all kinds for specific regulated entities who are going to get their codes of conduct. It's relying a lot more on the CMA to figure this out, and it's giving them an absolutely huge amount of power. Um, so I think as an aside, I think you do, you know, before we get into the kind of the concept of regulation, you do kind of have to wonder how the UK ended up here. You know, there are advantages to that UK approach. It gives you more flexibility if you don't have these things written, you know, if you don't have the kind of sex as you're addressing, for example, written into the law. But I'm not sure if ministers or parliament really started from an assumption, from a sort of intention to create such a distinctively empowered regulator. Um, with you know, latitude to create you know, what you, you could really kind of see as tax powers, uh, tax and subsidy powers across a wide range of sectors. Um, it's certainly an interesting contrast, I think, with where a lot of, you know, this is the Conservative Party, right, where a lot of American Conservatives worried about the administrative state uh, in which policymaking is passed from the democratic settings to agencies. Uh, so I've written about this for the Telegraph because I think it's a really interesting kind of uh, thematic um, developments in UK tech policy. Um, I'd, I'd encourage you to read the article. I'll try to include a link in the text for this video. Uh, but here I'm going to focus more on the kind of the 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 the, 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 ob the obligations that are in these two two bills, and hopefully that will become come clear quite why I think this is such a stark difference between DMA and DMCC. So finally, before we get into the specifics, I want to just kind of talk a bit about the general approach to regulating digital markets. Like how is this actually going to kind of work uh, as sort of businesses become regulated and then get obligations? So this covers the core regulation, what's called conduct requirements in the in, and, and, and uh, pro-competition um, interventions in the UK and the, kind of the obligations in the DMA. There is also other stuff in these bills, but I didn't want to kind of get these turn these graphics into a spider's web. In both cases, the first step is designation. Are you in scope? We'll come on to how that's done in the next slide because it varies in quite important ways. In the EU, there's a set of obligations that apply to all designated organisations with some specific type of businesses. Uh, platforms are required to report on their compliance and then that provides a basis for, for and that or other you know, investigations provide a basis for enforcement. In the UK, as I mentioned, you've got two processes. You've got codes of conduct, and crucially, they're going to be set for specific platforms. They'll be enforced through investigations with failures to reach an agreement on the clauses around fair and reasonable trading, for example, leading to a mandatory final offer process. And you might have alongside that these pro-competition interventions. They're similar to the current powers of the CMA to intervene through market investigations, but they're intended to be faster uh, and you know, there's some restrictions on the ability to challenge them. Um, 
So I think the, the crucial differences here, just stepping back and looking at this graphic, is that the the UK approach is, is, is much more firm by firm. And it's much more the regulator is going to figure out what the obligations should be. Whereas the DMA, there are rules written in the DMA and they've applied to a set of platforms, which while there absolutely will be fights and disputes at the margin, applies to sets of platforms which have been written in the DMA. Uh, it's quite a big difference in terms of how these things are going to work, how, how people's ability to plan for these regulations um, and how they adapt uh, over time. So just um, on that designation question. So for the EU DMA, DMA, this should generally be relatively simple. The Commission, there's a set of, you know, in both cases here, they're trying to get to are these uh, businesses that have a, an, an entrenched power uh, in, a, in, other mar in other markets. But the, the DMA that sh that's supposed to normally be done through a set of quantitative thresholds for the, really for the size of the business, both its overall um, uh, size by you know, market capitalization, but also its number of business and individual users. Now there absolutely is an expectation that the commission will vary from this standard um, where appropriate, but that's supposed that gives you, I think, a, it, it's, it's intended to provide a solid rule of thumb about who will be in or out of scope. The UK, on the other hand, is focused on this question of strategic market status and a set of um, tests, which um, you know, there will be lots of quantification going into how they're assessed, they're assessed absolutely, but you know, fundamentally a set of you know, qualitative questions about the nature of the business and its market position. Um, now, you know, I'm going to keep coming back to, this, back, back to this, I'm afraid, but the UK approach is more flexible. You know, it allows you to adapt more to the circumstances of individual firms, markets, how that might change over time, but it also means a lot more latitude for the regulator. You know, there will still be important decisions for the EU, for example, over the boundary between different uh, potential gatekeeper services that platforms might, op might operate and, and, and what's treated as a single gatekeeper versus what's split up and treated separately. That will matter for how, these, uh, how the obligations are implemented. But it's nothing like as kind of a uh, blank sheet of paper as the, the UK rules. I think that will have some, some practical implications as well. So like in the UK, it will probably mean you'd think it'll take longer for the UK to extend regulation to all of the platforms that will eventually be in scope. It means a longer period of uncertainty, it might mean some unevenness between those who are and aren't regulated over in, in, the, in the early months and years potentially. Uh, and they'll be, the pressure will be on for them to designate the big platforms quickly. Um, but it's, it, it, it's also going to be, be, be a difference in terms of how, business, how organizations have to approach this. You know, digital platforms operating in the UK are going to have to do a lot of regulatory, a lot, you know, a lot more regulatory engagement because uh, there's a lot more analysis to be, to be, to be done uh, to go into that SMS decision versus, you know, again, you, you should be able to to, to get to, a, to a, at least a decent starting answer using the DMA's quantitative tests. If we come into um, uh, the actual obligations now, uh, first one I think probably possibly mo I mean, probably most importantly is regulation of commercial terms, prices and the rest that platforms offer to their customers. So both laws use versions of the fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory language, which is kind of common, commonplace in economic regulation. And crucially means that commercial terms will no longer be up to the platform's discretion. These are going to be regulated markets where the, the terms will have to satisfy regulators. And if a customer, particularly a business customer, is unhappy about the terms, there will be a regulator they can go they, they can go to it won't be a case of well just take your business elsewhere or get into a commercial negotiation that commercial negotiation will be backstopped by regulation um look this is easier said 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 than done and the implementation of this with platforms complying reporting on their compliance being reviewed is going to be a major issue for the dma and i think in the dma where they've been relatively specific about where this is going to apply the big challenge is going to be okay. How? What's the process by which we get to an agreement that terms are fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory, or adjust uh, terms if needs be to get there? 
In the UK, the MCC is much more open. If firstly, it's, just, it's not limited the way it is in DMA to specific types of online platforms. Uh, it could cover a much greater range of activity. And secondly, but it does include specific mechanisms to get to friend. And these are, I, I believe, modeled on the Australian news media bargaining code. Um, so in essence, if a strategic market Say firm, SMS firm is trading with a third party. They breach an enforcing order by failing to agree what fair and reasonable terms. The DMU can't, the digital markets unit within the CMA cannot address this with the other tools available. Then it can get actively involved to gather and share information between the parties. Each party then submits a final offer, and the the, the, the CMA and it's the DMU unit within it decides on the right answer. And that it's that I, mean, I think really that should just 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 hammer home the extent to which these are now going to be regulated markets if they're subject to this kind of re requirement. You will have in the end the, that question over what the commercial terms are is going to be decided by the regulator, uh, not by the, um, the the business concerned. Now the intention is to is to incentivize a deal. It's to have that kind of regulator power there as a backstop. This is what they did in Australia, and in most, in I think, in in lots of cases, led to negotiated deals. Um, but it is a it's a big, uh, you know, th that was a the news media bargaining code giving the CMA an ability to do that across a wide range of sectors uh, on its own initiative is a huge deal. Uh, you know, it comes close to giving I think the CMA effectively tax raising powers. You can tax one business, subsidise an, a, another versus the status quo ante. Anyway, so despite those differences, all that was said, the immediate job for digital platforms is going to be quite similar. Any business that thinks it will or might be regulated under these laws needs to give serious attention to how they articulate the case for their commercial terms. They're going to need serious analysis of the value exchanges within the platforms they operate, why the way they work the way they do, how different market participants are treated. You know, don't forget, this isn't just fair terms, non-discriminatory terms. So a proper analysis of, of, of why outcome, outcomes are equivalent across different parties uh, trading on the platform, explaining the reasons why there might be any apparent differences. It's going to require an explicit value model of a sort platforms that are just often not needed up to now. Uh, they're going to need it in, you know, in Europe. They're going to need it, I think, probably in other geographies sooner rather than later. And it is going to be a change of mindset for a lot of digital, digital platforms. For other businesses involved, they're going to have to give their own thoughts. Okay, what does the value model look like here? How are we going to it going to what how are we going to articulate for the regulator a view that we've been we're being treated fairly or unfairly? Because otherwise, you know, this will shift this can shift the balance within these platforms in a way that can help some and hurt others. Next, data. Now this is an area where the DMA is goes a lot heavier. Um, you know, it's talking about all sorts of restrictions on how digital platforms bring together different kinds of data that they hold. The UK could get all or part of this out of the codes of conduct. So there are specific reference to, to data in a couple of clauses within the conduct requirements section. And it'll be interesting to see to what extent in practice the UK ends up just looking at the, what happens under the DMA, looking at any disclosures that come out in the EU that don't come out in the UK. If it feels they're worthwhile, it has the power now to push for the same thing. So the obvious short term incentive, I think, for platforms is to solve for these requirements in the EU, but make sure they've got an eye to needing to deploy the same thing elsewhere. The UK, but also other markets that might replicate some of these demands uh, for data restrictions in the EU over time. I think this might be particularly likely around cross use as a form of self preference along where platforms kind of have an advantage in one market because of the data they're collecting in another. I think that's a, a broad concern versus, say, targeted ads, where I think there is just a distinctive concern about targeted ads around Brussels and around some EU member states, which is a bit more EU specific, not by all means entirely EU specific, but a bit more EU specific. If we move on to the flow of information going the other way, uh, there's a lot about this in DMA. All kinds of requirements for sharing information that platforms will now have to assemble, make accessible, often at a very high frequency. So right up to finding real-time access to data, 
which you know i mean i, I think there's sometimes a tendency to think that a big digital platform company can just do all this you know click of the thing fingers that it's just not you know i think the reality these are complex organizations lots of products divisions units etc easier said than done uh, and I think particularly easiest than others to do it reliably, because of course, if there's errors in this data, you're not just likely to infuriate your customers, but you could get that could then be subjects of regulatory attention. Uh, I did a video on that um, about these kind of disclosures and why they might matter um, uh, before, uh, and worth, which I think is worth taking a look at if, the, if that is of interest. Uh, I think the CMA could create any of these requirements through codes of conduct. But it might be slow going and i think it'll depend again how much that's seen as impactful when it's disclosed under dma or of course if there's other sort of data types topics which uh, are of interest uh, from a cma where, where cma thinks transparency will be will be impactful finally of course data is part of a broader story in terms of restrictions on self-preferencing where platforms use their position in one market to strengthen their place in another this is an interesting dynamic. You know, obviously, it could be a barrier to comp could be a barrier to competition, but it could also be a source of competition. You've got to remember that a lot of the time, new entrants aren't kind of creating a startup out of a garage, right? Like they're entering a market using their strengths in other markets. You know, think about the digital advertising market, where the two biggest players have been losing ground to other players who've got strengths in e-commerce or in uh, video sharing. And so they're, they're able to build digital advertising businesses off of this, the back of that. And so you need to be careful about assuming that ability to leverage from one market into another is always a bad thing for competition. It can be kind of how competition happens uh, in, in, mar in, in, in a lot of markets. Both laws contain, in this case, pretty similar provisions on self-preferencing. The DMA is more specifically focused on rankings. There's, there's some other versions of this in other segments, but rankings covers a wide range of activity. They include single answers generated by an AI system or a smart speaker. So it doesn't need to be a ranking in the sense of like a search engine results. Um, if we come on to interoperability, I think this is where platforms are required to interact with each other. So, for example, you have to be able to send a WhatsApp message to your friends on Signal. Uh, it's one of the most technically demanding, and I think potentially vulnerable to abuse areas in these reforms. Um, it's an area where there's quite a lot of detail in the DMA. You know, for example, a kind of roadmap for instant messaging. Now, translating that to implementation is still going to be a huge task. But it does contrast to a very broad statement of powers in the DMCC, uh, which gives, I think, the CMA a lot of free reign to define how this should be implemented. I think, as in many other areas, I think it will be interesting almost to see the extent to which they look at DMA and say, how far do we want to vary from that as they kind of actually get stuck into delivering this in practice? So next area I want to talk about is choice is choices now there's, there's a number of uh of rules uh, in, around here around do people just use the default default search engine for example or to what extent are they even allowed to choose between different uh um uh, different kinds of services within a digital platform like a like a mobile operating system so the antidote that's been tried in a lot of specific cases under existing competition powers is various forms of choice screens uh, I've got an example uh, there in the, in the in the middle of this screen where you're requiring the platform, in this case Android, to present you a, cho a choice in this case of, of, of browser. But you can imagine similar things for all kinds of different digital platforms. It's kind of forcing users to make a choice. Uh, and both these uh, regulations include requirements in this area. Uh, in DMA, including requirements to make it easy to remove software, requirements around virtual assistance, so you might be prompted about whether you want Siri on your Android phone or, um, you know, or, or the Google Assistant on your uh, iPhone or what are, and all kinds of, sort of kinds of different changes. As in other areas, the CMA has a very broad power to match those requirements on the DMCC, uh, but it will be you know, sector by sector, firm by firm. Um, there's restrictions on using other certs or what, stopping restrictions on them using other services. Um, these this can be part of how platforms maintain their integrity. You know, part of the customer pitch for a lot of platforms is that they create a, a safer space, a more controlled 
space. It can mean a, to either to keep people outright safe or sort of just to improve the user experience. It has also been seen as another means for digital platforms to use their influence in one service to give themselves an advantage in other markets. There are lots of requirements in DMA in this area, covering everything from being able to transact off platform and have that take effects in the platform through to opening up third party app stores where it starts to cross over with interoperability. I don't think there's anything in this area, again, that the CMA couldn't replicate in practical terms. With all the workload, you, you will have to kind of see where its priorities lie. You know, looking at the investigations thus far, you, know, you can see some obvious candidates, you know, mobile ecosystems and app stores, for example. Uh, but you know, we'll have to see as the CMA starts to translate this into, you know, as this sort of bill passed into law and then the CMA starts to implement. There is finally, you know, elements on merger control here. In both cases, um, you know, I won't go into this in too much detail because I think it's a smaller range of people who really need to engage with this. But, but broadly speaking, it's aiming to increase the likelihood that regulators see merger, di mergers coming in these digital markets early. And I think the, can, the what it will force platforms to do is engage and make the case for mergers uh, which previously would just not have got a lot of attention uh, from regulators. You know, Facebook buying Giphy would be the kind of the canonical example here. Um, I think it's also going to be harder in many ways to engage with merger, with, with, with merger control as it gets more speculative. I think we saw this in the Microsoft Activision deal where because they were the CMA was concerned about impacts on the cloud gaming sector, which to put it crudely is not really much of a thing yet. It's harder for Microsoft and Activision to put the regulator's mind at ease because you know, that you're know you kind of wrestling with how could this affect competition the so you, in, in the future. So there's no one for you to do a deal with this, that's going to really going to persuade the regulator. There's it, It's just hard for you to um, shape the merger in a way that will get approved. And so I think these merger cards will be a big deal. Um, and it's really, but it's, you know, I think it is in terms of amping up, enabling more action uh, um, in the same kind of direction that we've seen using existing powers. Finally, I think it's worth mentioning here the other consumer protection restrictions. You know, they're a non-trivial part of DMCC, as I mentioned at the start. I think it really needs another comparison video, though, because a lot of um, the relevant points of EU comparison are in other regulations. Uh, e.g. You know, particularly the, the package of directives called the New Deal for Consumers. You know, this is a good reminder that while the DMA and DCC are pretty direct parallels as far as these things go, they are taking place in different contexts. Uh, and the EU and the UK are dividing things a bit differently in terms of their, kind of their package of, law, of, of how they're updating uh, laws to reflect the growth of digital markets and digital platforms. And so there are other examples, but it's worth, again, the UK Online Safety Bill and the EU Digital Services Act are very different. That means that that, um, that again, changes the context for these rules. Uh, and I think it's worth mentioning this as well because they will have their own competition implications. Uh, you know, firstly, because they include measures that affect business users of digital platforms. So, for example, the DMA requirement to publish all digital ads in a searchable repository, including information on how they're targeted. You know, that will have competition implications, right? That will affect how the that could affect market operation by telling people things about how that market is working. Secondly, because they're creating large compliance costs, and that might, you know, if you add up across these different regulations, that might start to force the less commercially successful digital platforms to scale back their activities in Europe. Or in extremis, you know, obviously we've already had signals from some of the messaging platforms. There may be requirements they aren't willing to comply with that they believe or say they would quit the market over. So, uh, you know, restrictions on end-to-end -end encryption, for example. So these are worth bearing in mind. I, I won't focus on this, on you know, getting into, you know, the, the nature of what the MCC is planning to do on subscriptions, for example, here. But it is, it is part of this law and it's worth bearing in mind as part of the overall picture. So finally, I appreciate it's been a long video. I had to kind of get it's quite a lot to get your teeth into. And, and look, there, there will be plenty I've missed, plenty else you could say. These are uh, you know, big laws and they're going to have important consequences.
So just stepping back quickly, what does this all mean? For digital platforms, I think it's going to require an upgrade first in their UK regulatory engagement. As I mentioned at the start, particularly some really serious analytical work on the value model underpinning their services so that they can respond persuasively and consistently, crucially, to a need to how they meet fair and reasonable tests or adjust, know where they need to give and adjust their behaviour. I think it should also strengthen the case to think seriously about whether some of the capabilities being built in response to EU DMA should either be ready to be stood up elsewhere or should just be done elsewhere. You know, the platforms have done this before in response to say like GDPR or the UK Age of Appropriate Design Code. It wouldn't be the first time. And some of the, if, you know, if you're looking at a clause in DMA and thinking this isn't unreasonable, I think one potential consequence that might be, well, then other governments might follow that path uh, and might and therefore maybe we should go ahead and get this and get this just just do this at a global level uh, particularly they might have additional benefits in terms of you know, open, you know strengthening that relationship with business or, or, or consumers in other areas these regulations do reflect distinctive european concerns um, and platforms will need to manage that as best they can uh, for other businesses, you know, they're going to have to get up speed on this too. If you look at other regulated markets, you know, telco, say, it's not just the telcos who do regulatory affairs work, right? It's, it's it, you know, it's the businesses that engage with them. You know, looking at, you know, getting a better sense of of how this is going to change how platforms operate and the consequences for your business, because there may be opportunities and threats coming out of this, particularly if it weakens services that you currently enjoy. Uh, Finally, for policymakers, I think everywhere we need to give some serious thought to the aggregate impacts of all this regulation on the incentives to create new networks. Dynamic competition in digital platforms is so important. That creative process is so valuable. And I do worry that it's starting to get harder and harder to make a case for or use um, those, at, those kind of strengths from other markets to be able to enter uh, new segments. Beyond that, I, I do feel, as I argued in the Telegraph article, the UK DMCC needs at least a few more checks and balances on the huge latitude that the Competition and Markets Authority is being given. So, look, I appreciate this is a long one. Uh, you know, I hope you had a coffee and a snack to get this get 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 through it. Um, I'd love to know what you think down in the comments, and please do like and subscribe. I'm sure there'll be a lot more to say about these and similar uh, rules going forward.